Well, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our weekly webinar. This is Hal Gregory, superintendent. We'll go ahead and just get started here. There's about 25 attendees, 26. It'll probably go up a little bit as we, as we go. Um, so I appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, obviously, we had some, uh, you know, big news this week. So we're going to go over that a little bit. And uh, as we do each week, really what we want to do is answer questions that are on your mind. So if you have some questions, please start uh, jumping in on the Q&A uh, section here and feel free. I already see there's a couple of questions in there, which is awesome. We'll do our best to answer like we do every week. Not sure if we'll have the uh, answers for everything, but uh, we can certainly try to get the answers to what we don't have. So uh, we have this webinar tonight. We'll, we'll go you know, as long as we need to, but no more than an hour. And that's been plenty of time the last three weeks uh, to, to answer questions and, and go over what, what our, uh, what our folks are asking. So anyways, I, I appreciate everyone joining me. I appreciate the panelists who are all, uh, administrators within our district. So, uh, they have been joining us each and every week. So thank you guys for making some time tonight and, uh, being a part of this. We will have one more of these next week, next Wednesday at six and our commitment, at least at the, uh, at, at the, probably the end of August when we started these, was to go ahead and, and have these through the end of September. So we're gonna do that. And then I think we're gonna back off and maybe you know look at a schedule that we might do something once a month. I don't know, we're gonna kind of see uh, how valuable people think they are. But certainly uh, for those of you that are on, I hope you feel it's valuable. You have access to just about the entire leadership team to ask questions. And uh, we're all going through something unique. We're all going through something uh, difficult. We're all going through something that we don't even know what's next half the time, but uh, we're gonna do our best to, to talk about where we're headed as a school district tonight. I think most of the questions may be centered around you know that. So I'll just go ahead and start with a little update. Hopefully everyone on the call received our, our, our updated back to school plan, restart plan that we put out on Monday. Uh, just to, to go back a little bit, in history as we've gone through this journey uh way back when we decided to go rome okay in the middle of in the middle of summer last summer there was a lot of uncertainty about what we should do uh, we were talking about bringing our kids all back we were building a hybrid plan and talking about remote and uh towards the end of summer the lucas county health department came out and made a recommendation strong recommendation to have schools in Lucas County go remote. And so we followed that recommendation along with many other school districts in the county. So, so we started the year off that way. And, and you know, not knowing again from week to week what, what the landscape was going to be, uh, we just kind of put a plan in place that we would reevaluate what we were going to do around October 1st. And the reason we picked October 1st was that was the date the health department indicated to us that they were gonna go ahead and maybe update their recommendation. Um, I haven't heard that that's gonna happen or not gonna happen. Uh, I do have weekly communications with the health department. I think the plan is uh, to continue for that uh, Lucas County board to, to hold a meeting and, and possibly do a recommendation. But what we've all learned since is we've kind of moved on from strictly that recommendation and school districts began to build plans based on what they felt was right, based on what they felt was the next steps for each district. So each district in Lucas County has kind of moved forward in a, in a different uh, kind of pathway. But knowing everyone, uh, knowing the leaders in many of those districts, I think the goal for everyone is to eventually get back to school with our kids and, and get back uh, to full time. So we unveiled our plan on Monday, our next phase plan, and essentially it is this. Um, we, we decided to move up by a, just a couple of weeks, our students in grades K through, five, uh, K through six. Uh, again, part of our plan was always to kind of wait till the end of the first quarter to really know what was happening. But obviously listening to families and, and reading the tea leaves and understanding what's happening in Lucas County and around the area, we felt it was appropriate to, to bring our kids back here next week on October 5th. So, or not next week, week and a half, sorry. <laughs> I don't wanna, or when, when is it? Is it next week? No, week and a half. Get my calendars mixed up. So on October 5th, Monday, October 5th, we're going to be bringing back 
our students in grades K through six. So at the three elementary schools in Eisenhower um, in our hybrid model. So these kids are gonna come back whether based on their last names, A through K and L through Z, uh, based on their last names or any other adjustments that may have been made working with families in each school uh, on the Monday, Thursday, or the Tuesday, Friday model with two days in school, three days remote. All right, so I think most of us understand that, that, that plan as of now. Those kids in grades K through six will then stay in hybrid mode for two weeks. Uh, and why two weeks? Well, we just felt it was two weeks was, was uh, the minimal amount of time that we want to get kids and our staff reacclimated back to school, to learn the procedures, to, to understand what's going on, and for us to evaluate our plans and make sure they're working, or at least we believe they're working, and make adjustments before we bring everybody back five days a week. So, so those kids in K3, K through six are gonna start on October 5th and they're gonna to come to school two weeks in hybrid and then starting on October 19th, which is the official first week of the second quarter, we're gonna bring those kids back five days a week, um, every day, normal schedule, full time, okay? So that's how the schedule is gonna work for K through six. Uh, seven through 12 is a little bit more complicated, uh, only from the standpoint of there's a little bit more high stakes with their grading related to credits for high school. And we strongly felt, this group, myself and others, strongly felt that bringing students back before the end of the quarter was just not feasible. We just didn't feel that was right. Uh, we wanted to have the entire quarter uh, be one type of instruction, which was remote. Uh, we were just getting in, we are just getting in the groove of that and we're learning, you know, obviously as we go along kids are understanding at least the expectations under the remote model at this point in time. So we just felt that it was, it was important to stay consistent for the first quarter. So with that being said, the plan then is to, on October 19th, bring our kids seven through 12 back uh, in a hybrid model for two weeks. So again, following the same green gold uh, division of students, bring our kids back to school for two weeks and really evaluate uh, our hallway procedures, our lunch procedures, um, and really getting kids to understand the importance of, of following the rules within the school. I, I really have confidence that, that kids are going to follow rules and, and follow the, the new procedures that we have in place based on talking with uh, a couple of other superintendents whose students have been back in hybrid, that, that kids are doing a great job really across the region, following the rules and doing the things that they need to do to keep, their, keep the others safe. So I feel very confident that that'll be the same here in Oregon. So then we're gonna go for two weeks hybrid and then on November 2nd, uh, we're gonna bring the kids back five days a week, all, all in. So again, uh, in my letter that I put out on Monday, I just wanna emphasize, this is the plan. And this is the plan that we plan uh, to stick to, that we uh, you know, have full intentions to stick to. But we do know that things change unanticipated, sometimes quickly, uh, new orders come out, um, things can change quickly. And, and I just, in my letter, I said this, you know, kind of throughout that conditions can change and most likely they will change. So I just want to prepare all of us inside the schools and all of you outside of the schools that something could change. Um, and then in, a, on, in addition to, you know, whether or not we, we change this plan, there will be disruptions once we implement the plan at school. We know that COVID didn't go away. <laughs> We know that other schools are experiencing quarantines. We're fully remote right now. We are experiencing quarantines with our staff. Almost daily, uh, we will have a staff member or someone that has been in contact with someone with COVID that is causing us to isolate or quarantine that, that staff member. It's just the way it is. It's going to be the same way once we have students. But the goal is to minimize that risk through all the precautions that we're gonna have in place uh, at school. And, and knowing that there's always going to be a risk, but also knowing that we want our kids back in school and, and learning in front of our teachers and in those classrooms is, is the best way to learn. Uh, I think we all can agree on that. 
So I just want to reassure all our families and everything that we're, that everybody that, that's involved, that we're going to do our darndest um, to, to keep our kids safe and keep our staff safe. Um, that means wearing a mask every day. That means our staff and students are going to wear a mask all the time. Um, we understand that may be difficult for some, and we're going to work through those individual, you know, difficult situations. We know there's going to be some, but we'll work through those one at a time. Uh, and, and helping each person to, to, to get through the day and get through the weeks as best they can. We're gonna have PPE, or uh, we're gonna have a hand sanitizer available. We're going to be in disinfecting on a regular daily basis in all the classrooms. Uh, we're gonna do everything we can uh, to minimize any type of spread. And to be completely honest, we will be probably one of the safest places to be is going to be in school. And that's what's kind of panning out. That doesn't mean something can't happen, but, but we're gonna need everyone's help to, to keep the virus out of our schools. And that means families, parents, please, we're gonna beg you, <laughs> if you feel your son or daughter is ill in any way, even if you, and I've heard this story over and over and over again, I thought it was just allergies, <laughs> okay? I thought it was just what happens normally with my cough. I thought it just was. What I'm asking everybody to think of is think it's COVID first, all right? Think and plan for the worst and then hope for the best. And don't send those kids to school if you have any you know, worry whatsoever that they may have something going on. And, and I'm telling you, I, I've heard it every day that people say, I just think it is, and it isn't. And, and please just be very aware that, that we're not going to penalize kids, all right, that are staying home sick. I know it's going to feel different, but we're going to be working through our attendance. Um, I know one of the questions in here will be about automatic failure and those types of things. We're going to do our best to minimize those types of things if they're COVID-related because the number one priority for the school district and for me as superintendent is to keep everybody safe and keep everybody in the school as much as possible. So that is the basic plan. I just wanted to kind of lay that out for everybody because I, I have a feeling that's where most of the questions are, are going to be. Um, so what else has been happening around the schools? Really what we're doing right now ever since Monday is we're really starting to beef up the the specifics of the plan. We, we've had the general layout of our plan since, since last spring, to be honest with you, and certainly since summer. But now it's working out those details. Uh, details like how are we going to um, deal with the lunchrooms, right? The lunchrooms are a big question mark for a lot of people. But I think we're coming down to some pretty solid plans on how we're going to deal with that. And one of the additions that we're going to be adding to our lunchrooms our plastic um, um, dividers, if you will, plastic little face shields, portable uh, desk dividers, if you will, that we're going to try to keep them the, to minimize the amount of, you know, I guess the aerosol that comes out while kids are eating because kids won't be able to wear a mask while they're eating. So, so we're going to be adding those at our school lunch areas. May look a little bit different at each building based on their lunchroom layouts and those types of things, but. But uh, we're going to be doing that. We're going to be getting those uh, ordered here shortly and, and, and in, hopefully in uh, by the time school starts, certainly by the time that all kids are arriving. Uh, we're going to be spacing kids out as much as possible, but I just want to reinforce the idea that when we bring all our kids back, we're not going to be at six foot in every classroom and certainly not at six foot in the lunchrooms. But we're going to do, again, everything we can to minimize, um, minimize the spread by, by just distancing as much as we can and having less kids in the lunch rooms doing that. We're going to have markers throughout the buildings. We're going to have signage posted throughout the buildings, all those types of things. Same thing all our schools are doing, but we, we need you as families to, to reinforce uh, all of that with, with your children. And that's going to really help all of us keep kids in school, hopefully for the remainder of the year. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and start addressing questions. And then that questions can, you know, can lead us into some other discussions um, moving throughout the hour here. So I'm going to go ahead and open these up and we'll just kind of start. And as always, panelists, uh, leadership, if there's something here I get stuck on, please feel free to just unmute and, 
and jump in and help me out with the answer. So uh, we, the first question was the one I referenced here a minute ago. So how will unexcused absences go? Will students still be limited to five? And I'm pretty sure that that more focused at the high school, but I'm not sure exactly. So I don't know, Mr. Sig, maybe you could tackle that from a high school perspective. Um, yeah, the, the, the we are not looking at uh, limiting the uh, unexcused absences to five for um, at least this semester. Um, obviously, as you stated, a student who's sick and needs to stay home, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, needs to stay home. So um, <clears throat> sounds like you need to stay home, Mr. Sig. <laughs> Done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. And and I think that's definitely a, a round robin type of thing. I don't know if any of the other buildings have anything to add to the to the uh, attendance piece. Um, what 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 we what we want though is for kids to be in school uh, if they're not sick. <laughs> so I just want to reemphasize that that we 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 really hope we can get kids back in school when they're not sick. But if you are sick, stay at home. And uh, we're gonna, again, we're gonna try to work anything out that we can to, to help those kids get through their classes and certainly provide material for them uh, like we've done in the past. But uh, again, that's, that's gonna be an evolutionary process as we go through this together. Um, okay, next question. Can we see slash access the COVID dashboard numbers that we are supposed to be submitting to the state each week? So, so what we've done, at least so far, is if you look at our website, uh, if you go on just the main page of our website, we put some basic COVID numbers that are out there and they're up to date as of Monday. So every Monday, we're going to be updating those numbers. So if you go to our website and you'll see a, I don't know, it's, it's, it's just a mini banner, but it's, we're, we're calling it kind of a, just a COVID-19 data update. And basically it gives uh, student, or I'm sorry, it gives employees the number of uh, employees that were quarantined during the past week. And then it also gives a cumulative number that have been in quarantine since we've started, okay? Um, and then we also have on there the number of employees that have tested positive and then a cumulative number for those who have tested positive. And then we're doing the exact same thing related to students, all right? So this is how we're gonna kind of, for now, uh, put our dashboard out there. It's, it's, it's not super elaborate, but it gives the main two pieces of information that we, that we are reporting to, to the health department on a regular basis. Um, so obviously those numbers are gonna look different when we bring kids back to school, uh, especially if there's one student in a class and a number of other kids get quarantined. So you'll see those numbers go up. So, so that's, where we're, that's how we're doing it right now, uh, trying to keep it simple and understandable, but also be transparent related to uh, the numbers that we have. So again, you see the date from 914 through 921, so again, we'll update it next Monday on 928. So then you'll see the dates from 921 through 928. Hopefully that helps. Okay, next question. Do, do teachers feel as though they are being able to teach as much as is needed with remote learning or they, do they feel as though the kids are falling behind? Well, um, I think that's a very uh, specific question and, and probably teachers will have different questions. Um, there is no way you can provide the same uh, level of instruction remotely, at least not how we're doing it and most are doing it, that we do in person. So I've heard stories that it's going very, very well and the teachers feel like kids are keeping up with the content. But I've also heard from teachers that say it's very frustrating for some kids because it's, it's hard to interact and really understand uh, their specific you know, needs and questions. So I don't know, do prince, any principal, do you have maybe any feedback? You've, you, you're more in direct contact with the teachers than I. Anybody willing to? 
give a little update what their teachers are feeling and how it's going? Yeah, I, I could answer for FACET. Um, I would just echo what you said, Mr. Gregory, about not being able to, you know, replicate in-person instruction. That's, I think, first and foremost that, you know, we don't have any misunderstandings about that. We, we totally agree with that. Um, but I think our teachers are, I feel like they're, for lack of a better word, getting in a groove now where they feel comfortable um, with the instruction, feel like kids are responsive and kids are more engaged and, and more interactive now. Uh, so they're in a good place. I feel like, you know, there, there are hiccups, obviously, you know, just with anything, but um, they're feeling better, certainly, than they were four weeks ago. So I, I feel really good about that. Yeah, I mean, anybody else want to jump in there? I mean, that's okay. I mean, so, so I, I, be honest with you, the, 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 the reality is, is our teaching staff are a cross section of society, just like we all are, just like you all are. And we have a bell curve of concerns about bringing kids back and bell curve of concern of excitement about bringing kids back. And, and, and I, I certainly believe that, that our teachers, um, will make up as much of the gaps that may, may be out there as possible. And it may take a little bit of time uh, back when we're full time to, to get some kids caught up, but, but we're all feeling a pinch and we're all in it together and it's everybody. Um, so there's kids that are much more comfortable with what we're doing now than others. And there's families much more comfortable than we are doing with others. And there's teachers much more comfortable <laughs> doing it than others. So uh, I think the next question, uh, so thank you for that question. Uh, the next question is a little bit lengthy here. So let me do my best at reading it and digesting it. There seems to be some differences among teachers regarding the SATs at the high school. Today, my son was, was to have six SAT sessions. And SAT are like student assist, assistance teams or times that, that they can schedule with their teachers. Teachers only showed up to three of them. The other three sessions he signed into and just waited until he was pretty sure that the teacher wasn't going to join. Is there a better way to do this? Shouldn't the teachers be able to put something out on the Zoom meeting stating that a meeting isn't happening today? Even better, it would be a good idea to put it on the kids' calendars in Schoology when there is going to be a session. If it's on the calendar, there is one. If it's not on the calendar, there isn't one. Okay. Personally, I think there should be sessions at every class period. There is supposed to be one, but it's frustrating to watch kids sit there and wait. Additionally, if I see that my son isn't on a Zoom session during a class time, my first thought, first thought is that the kid isn't doing what he's supposed to be doing. Okay, fair question. Um, I don't know, can we, Mr. Sig, maybe talk a little bit about the high school SAT uh, and just the expectation of teachers. Is there, a, is there a missing link somewhere here between maybe some kids, some teachers. Um, so I guess the the question I would have in regards to that um, statement was um, whether or not there was uh, the communication that the teachers were expecting the students to show up or if the students asked the teacher to be there. Um, that's a big um, aspect of whether or not our teachers are, 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 are going to be sitting there. Um, they're not sitting around on Zoom um, for eight hours waiting for students to drop in. Um, but that time is built into the schedule that, um, you know, if there's some back and forth and some communication um, that they could uh, meet up with them. Um, so it, it, it kind of varies. Some teachers do schedule something into that time frame um, specifically so their students are there. Other student teachers might just grab small groups and it's just going to be different kind of with um, kind of every teacher. Um, so the parent is the name of the person that asked that question. Um, if you would like to give me a call tomorrow, I'd like to, you know, kind of figure out a little bit more about um, what that, uh, what the teachers, who they were and kind of, um, you know, what led up to that uh, situation. So she, uh, she or he could also send you an email, right, at gsig yep. at oregoncs.org either way, or just call Clay and ask for Mr. Sig. Okay, thank you uh, for that. Okay, uh, next question. Will kids get a chance to get in the school to drop off supplies and find their classrooms? So right now we do not have any plans to bring kids in early uh, that I am aware of. Um, 
to, to do that. I think that, that in theory sounds like a great idea, like, you know, kind of almost kind of like a mini open house, but given the situation that we're in, I think we're going to kind of use those first couple of weeks to, to do that. But, um, um, I, maybe, I don't know, Mrs. Molnar, I'm just thinking of an elementary, you know, perspective, you know, how do you see, uh, these little ones specifically with their, you know, supplies and their classrooms now, if they don't know where they're going, how that looks on maybe that first day that those kids come in. I know we had some kindergarten orientations that first week, but I believe that was it. Yeah, so we will, um, actually, we are getting ready to publish a revised school supply list that will be coming out from all the elementaries here shortly. So parents will need to follow those supply lists because they may have changed since our original supply list. And then given the fact that we are doing the hybrid, we'll have less students um, to facilitate as they come into the buildings, it will be easier to bring in their supplies. We do not have a plan for students to come in ahead of time. Um, they will bring those with them when they arrive for their first day of school. Yeah, I, I understand the, the need for that. Um, that that hope but i think we're just gonna that's why we're trying to make these uh first two weeks i think the second question here the next question is very simpler si similar um for new students at star elementary uh, will there be some kind of open house or tour made for new students at star elementary trisha i don't know if you want to address that i we could certainly if someone's you know just really really anxious and they wanted to set some kind of individual appointment with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could work with course. an individual mm -hmm. family. We do that periodically. Yeah. I mean, we can't do 300 of those. Right. But we, you know, there are some new families. Absolutely. And they can, if they can just call the office and then Ms. Malo will um, put them in contact with me or I can get with their teacher that they're um, assigned to. And then we can figure out a time that would be good for them to come in. Yeah, we want to be flexible, obviously, for, for families that are new and really have no idea what, what's happening. And, and so, uh, but, but it's going to be hard to just bring everybody in uh, all at one time or have like an open house type thing. And so, you know, hopefully we'll get back to that one day and next year we'll, we'll have the normal kind of routine. But uh, so Mr. Far, Gregory, uh, yeah. at Eisenhower, we are going to have, I'll send out some information this Sunday night on what it's going to look like and try to answer quite a few questions. Uh, but for fifth graders who haven't been in the building before, we will have them come into the auditorium. And since we're hybrid, uh, we'll be able to be socially distanced. We're very confident of that. And then the teachers will come down and get them one class at a time to take them where they need to be, show them the, the ropes, uh, because we recognize that they didn't, come to, they didn't get a chance to come visit uh, in the uh, spring. So that will be our protocol. And I'll send out a lot more information uh, this Sunday and the following Sunday. Awesome, thank you. Will lockers be used? If so, how will we manage the crowding that, that occurs while kids are at their lockers? So I don't know, why don't we start? Um, I don't think we have lockers at the elementaries. So I don't uh, start maybe, Mr. Holcomb, maybe uh, in your building, could you talk about lockers? Sure. We are going to do lockers this year, and I, I will put this out as well. But uh, for us, we'll use lockers, but we won't have locks on them because the only thing that will go in are their coats and their lunch boxes. Uh, everything else will go into the classroom with them because they're going to stay in the same space uh, throughout the day. Okay. Mr. Uh, Gibbs, maybe from the junior high perspective? Sure. Yeah, fast. So we, we do plan to use lockers. Uh, the only exception this year is under green and gold, uh, we'll assign every other one. So our green students will have even numbered lockers. Our gold students will have odd lockers. So they're spaced a little bit there. And then we plan on the students coming into the, the building um, intermittently, not all at once. Uh, so they'll be staggered and then uh, they'll drop off their items. And then we plan on, as of now, them carrying their belongings with them. We'll allow backpacks um, as of now through the day. So there's not um, opportunity for them to to stop their locker or not need for them to stop their lockers and uh, you know socialize or or be bunched up so we feel confident that will work out pretty well good and at the high school so our current plan um, we've got a larger building um, where the students need to come in and kind of see where their classes are and try to figure out 
where a good location for a locker would be. Um, so we don't plan on starting uh, when students come back to have a locker, but you know, towards the end of hybrid, students will have a better idea. There will be a sign-up process to give everybody an opportunity to you know, uh, figure out where a good location would be. Um, we have about 1,800 lockers um, in the building. Uh, most years, only about four or 500 get used, which means we can create gaps in between lockers so two lockers aren't being used side by side. You can create space that way. Um, we'll also try to look at the high traffic areas where a lot of students filter through the day and then use the lockers that are um, still uh, uh, accessible and easy to get to, but maybe not right there in the high traffic areas as well. Perfect, thank you. Next question, will students be able to maintain social distance when everyone is back or in back five days a week? So, so uh, social distancing is the number one uh, issue with bringing everybody back for sure. Uh, as I stated in my letter, we're, I'm confident, we're confident that we can keep kids at least three feet apart. Um, we will not be able to keep kids six feet apart. And in many classrooms, it'll be somewhere between three and six feet, depending on the size of the classroom and the number of kids that are in the classroom. And, and, uh, and, and that varies. Each teacher might have a different number of kids. And certainly when you get into the seven through 12, different, different periods have different numbers of kids. But if you think about the maximum amount of kids in a classroom, in the smallest room that we have. I still believe that we'll be able to get kids three feet apart. Uh, but what we are going to do for hallways, it's going to be very difficult. For lunch rooms, it's going to be very difficult, but we are going to try to implement structured, some kind of structured traffic patterns. I think principals have some ideas on how that might go. And, and uh, we're gonna have certainly defined seating. So if something does happen, we can contact Trace right now. The idea with bringing kids back into school is all about contact tracing and understanding where kids are. And so we're going to work very, very hard at understanding where kids are when and if something happens. Um, and obviously, we're going to use multiple lunch locations to, to try to reduce the number of kids uh, in the school. So, so social distancing is one of the trade-offs that you have uh, when you bring all kids back, for sure. Um, but at some point, we all have to learn to, to, to adjust to this new situation. And we just felt that, that, that we, need, we need to get our kids back in school and we're going to do everything we can to minimize the risk for that. Um, but again, I, uh, the six foot distancing, we're, we're going to do everything we can and, and remind kids and staff to, to, uh, to try to maintain that maximum amount of distance possible. Okay, uh, another question about freshmen. Will freshmen have the opportunity of any kind of orientation to find their classrooms before they return to in-person instruction? So uh, I don't believe we have a plan for any formal freshman orientation either. Is that correct? Uh, we were looking at possible dates. Um, you were thinking about one, okay. Yep, where we would be able to have uh, small groups of freshmen. We were talking, um, you know, maybe groups of five or 10 um, come in um, and, and then with a, an upperclassman or student council member um, get tours to help find their classes and then um, and then learn the building a little bit and navigate. Um, I don't think we have a final day on that and um, I'm sure it would be in Mr. Jersey's newsletter once it's uh, finalized here. Yeah we do have a little bit of time to, to put that in play before our uh, certainly before our freshmen come in so thank you for that. And there would be, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's second. okay. Um, there would be uh, multiple days. Um, I think when we were discussing it, it would be, uh, a, I think, a Saturday afternoon and then a Thursday after a school. So it wouldn't be during instructional time and a couple opportunities for students to get in. That was what we were discussing. So someone's asked, so if things can change, as you say, why not bring high school kids in sooner? If things change for the worst, then they'll have two more weeks in school before we change. Yeah, I mean, obviously that's, a, that's an argument and that's a, a, a point for a lot of people, but the bottom line is we're not going to change our, our program to, or our uh, instructional model for the high school kids until after the uh, quarter. So the quarter is the defining time and then we just don't want to bring them all in. We want to bring them in and, and a little bit of a phased in approach. So I know people are anxious. I get it. And I don't know if things are going to change. 
Um, I didn't say they would change. I said there's a strong possibility they could change. Uh, we're going to do everything, though, to minimize the risk so we don't have to change um, unless we're mandatory shut down. And I, I believe the only way that would happen is if our, our county went into a purple. Okay, I think if, it, if pretty much if our county went to purple, which is the, the, the worst level of COVID within the state of Ohio, or we had such an outbreak of the virus that the health department working with us uh, shut us down. So, I mean, again, those are, those are the extremes that could happen. Uh, we've not seen that happen. Uh, I know people are worried that this cold and flu season will merge with COVID um, at some point, whether it's, you know, November, October, December, January, we're not really sure. On the other hand, we're going to be disinfecting and having the cleanest schools we've ever had in the history of our schools. <laughs> so we're, we're ve I'm very hopeful that what we're going to be doing is going to make a huge difference with the amount of students that are out just from those, uh, uh, you know, flus and, and types of things. So we'll see. So I understand what you're saying, but uh, we're, we're going to stick with our plan as we, as we have uh, put it out and, uh, and I guess see where it goes from there. If kids or teachers have medical reasons not to wear a mask, isn't that a danger to other kids and teachers? Uh, it depends if they have COVID or not. It depends if they're sick or not, right? Uh, a kid or a student in and of themselves that aren't wearing a mask who isn't sick and doesn't have COVID, you know, isn't a risk. So again, there are very specific reasons though for those kids to not have a mask and it's in the law. So there's not a lot any of us can do about it, no matter how much we like it or dislike it. The fact is, is that we're going to have to deal with that situation as they arise. I don't expect a lot uh, of those situations, but I do expect some. And, uh, but again, those, those individuals who maybe have a medical or another reason not to wear a mask um, could very much wear a shield. Uh, and so that might be one of the nice compromises that we have is we'll have them put on a, a face shield and to at least give some level of, of protection from others. So we'll work through those one by one. Okay, next question. When kids go, to, go back to hybrid, how is that going to work on the days that kids are not physically in the classroom? So the three days they're out, will there be a live stream of the classroom when the teacher is teaching in the room? What are the kids, what are the kids that are at home doing when it is at home day, when it is the home day? <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm going to just say in general, kind of what's going to happen. And again, it's two weeks. So it's only two weeks because hybrid's the toughest model for everyone. <laughs> in terms of balancing both a remote education and an in-person education. And it's certainly very difficult for our teachers to balance, we anticipate it to be difficult, balancing both models. So we know it's gonna be difficult. Um, but in general, the teachers are gonna have students with them four out of the five days teaching. Right now, we do not intend to live stream those classes. Um, we are having lots and lots of discussions about how we can record what's happening uh, possibly and, and, and get it out to kids that maybe, for example, are quarantined or have to be home for medical reasons. Um, but the idea simply put is that they're going to be with their teacher two days a week and then be assigned work or other activities two or three days a week, depending on, on how much that works. So Mrs. Conco, maybe you could add a little bit to that. Yes. Um, when we think about those days when the students are remote, when they're at home, they're going to be working through Schoology and Google Classroom. Those platforms are still going to continue to be used. And we will have students in person Monday, Thursday, or Tuesday, Friday. So teachers will also be able to send things home with the students for them to complete during the time frame when they are learning remotely. But that, that learning will be primarily done independently um, without the, the in-person support of a teacher. Certainly the teacher is always available. You can email them or contact them through whatever messaging system they might use. Like in our elementary, we use ClassDojo 
with a lot of our parents. So the, the teachers will still be available. Um, their response time might be a little different because like you said, they're going to be teaching, they're going to be with students four days a week. So they're going to be teaching Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, but certainly if there are any questions, the teachers you know, will be available to answer them. Again, that response time might be a little bit different, but on those remote learning days, the students will be learning independently. Okay, thank you. Have we considered having all students pack their own lunches and eating in the classroom if they can be distanced more in, in the classroom than in the cafeteria? Well, uh, one, we're not allowed to have all the students pack their own lunches. I mean, there's a lot of rules about free and reduced lunches that we need to provide. And, and so we need to continue to provide lunches to, to a number of students within our district. Uh, certainly all kids have the option to, to, pack, to pack their uh, lunches and eat. But at the end of the day, um, whether they pack, whether we feed them, uh, it's logistic, it's two things. It's logistics, spreading them out while they eat and supervision of where they eat. And so those two pieces are, are, are what we're working on when we're putting our plans together. Um, I'm just thinking, um, like Mrs. Molnar, would you just tell kind of what your elementary cafeteria or lunch time is tentatively going to look like or feel like uh, with all the kids back? I mean, and just think about all the kids back and then cutting it in half, right? When half the kids are there for those two weeks. So I can speak to Koi, and I believe the other elementaries will be similar, not the same. But um, what we've done is we've measured out our seating. So that seating will be three to six feet apart within the cafeteria. Um, we will have nameplates on every seating uh, situation to where each child will be assigned a seat for lunch. So we will be able to know exactly where that child will be. Lunches will be delivered to the students, so they will not get into a lunch line. There will be no waiting in a line and being near other students in a line there. Um, so basically that's how that will operate. Uh, Mr. Gregory mentioned the partitions that the district is purchasing. So we do plan to use those in addition to the three to six foot social distancing. All students will have some form of hand washing or hand uh, sanitizing before lunch is served and then after lunch is over teachers will pick up classes from the cafeteria and head back to their classrooms. Good. Um, I don't know. Um, Miss, Mr. Gibbs, I know you're still in development. Maybe just give a kind of a rough idea of how you guys are going to kind of manage your lunch. I know you're looking at a couple of spaces as well as the high school. Sure. Yeah, a lot of similarities to, to Mrs. Molnar at Coy, um, except that we're gonna have two different locations. So to accommodate all of our kids, we'll have lunch in the cafeteria and in the gymnasium. Uh, cafeteria tables um, are long tables with round uh, seats. There'll be every other one. And then students won't sit across from each other. So it'll be more like a triangle or a zigzag. So they'll be socially distanced there as well. Um, they'll get to choose their seats initially so that you know they're by people they know or choose to sit by, but then they'll have assigned seats just for contact tracing. Same thing will take place in the gymnasium. Uh, those seats are numbered in there on the bleachers. So we'll use, uh, one, we'll use half the gymnasium because we still have classes, both seventh and eighth grade phys ed going on. Uh, so we'll put down the partition. And then we'll use uh, both sides of half of the gym, the bleachers. Students will sit there and eat. And then we'll rotate that. Um, having determined the time frame to rotate that, we just want to be fair to kids that get to rotate eating inside the cafeteria and, and the gymnasium. Uh, but that would more than likely be multiple weeks that, that we would do that. Um, so similar to, to Koi in the elementaries, they'll, uh, we're going to stagger how they uh, are both uh, sent down to the cafeteria and dismissed from the cafeteria. So it's not a large group of kids at one time. Uh, they'll get a hand sanitizer before coming in and then an opportunity to do the same when they leave the cafeteria as well or the gym. So you get the general idea, um, you know, each school is going to be a little bit tweaked, a little bit different because of their set setups. But uh, again, I, I think lunches will be, they'll be different for kids, but, but uh, you know, we're, we're, we have plans and, and we're going to, we're going to execute those plans. So, um, okay. Another question, which is a little bit around attendance. Um, if, 
if I keep them, if my students aren't, uh, if they aren't feeling well, like a cold or allergy, and, and can they work remotely versus being marked absent? How do we keep excused, unexcused absences from piling up or getting doctor's notes for all those cases? Thank you. So yeah, that, that, that's one of the biggest worries for families. And because you know what, most moms and dads really want to do the right thing and have kids in school and follow the rules and, and get notes and all those types of things. But we understand we're sitting here telling you one thing. And then if we, on the other hand, we're saying, oh, by the way, it's unexcused and you're being penalized for it, that would be uh, pretty hypocritical on, on our school's end for sure. Um, so we are going to, I mean, bottom line is, is the prime, I mean, we, we are keeping attendance because they're, believe it or not, there's just a few students that will take advantage of the situation and um, you know, not do what they're supposed to. But at the end of the day, what we wanna see is kids doing the work, right? And if they're truly sick, we need them to stay at home and you need to let us know um, what's, what's happening, uh, what's going on, why they're, because we'd much rather know why they're home, right? Than, than to not know at all. So I don't know, Mr. Quigg, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. I know you've been dealing more, more on the data entry side of the attendance, but maybe some of the conversations you've had with some of the principals. No, I mean, really, the only thing we're developed. It's like we lost him. Okay, well, we lost him. Sorry about that. <laughs> so... so Okay, we lost you there a little bit, Mr. Quigg. What's that? You froze on us. It says my internet connection's unstable, so we'll see. <laughs> um, we developed uh, how to handle kids who are put into quarantine. So through no fault of their own, maybe they were just sitting next to somebody else that was identified with COVID, so they can't be at school for two weeks. They'll be marked quarantine, which uh, is the same as a medically excused. It's just like a doctor gave them a note. Uh, it's not necessarily their fault that they can't be to school, but uh, they can't be there. So that's how we report that to the state. Yeah, and we, we need to really shore up our policy on how we, how we keep attendance as an accountable, but also not penalize everybody for, for doing the right thing. So more to come on that, but what, I, what I'm telling you now is do not panic about attendance. <laughs> if your kid's sick, stay at home. We're not going to penalize you to a point where, you know, it affects you. I mean, you, we still are going to expect work to be made up just like we have, have done any time for any kid that's sick. But, uh, but we understand from a, from a attendance standpoint, it's going to feel and look different. Uh, okay. Another uh, comment about coming back now. Um, let's see here. Hold on here. Okay. Okay, question. Why is there a rush to go back to full time instead of keeping the hybrid model longer, like through flu season? Uh, why are we only doing a two week minimum? Yep. Again, a lot of questions, a lot of debate and a lot of opinions. Those are those are the question. Those are the questions that everyone has an opinion on. Period. <laughs> Timelines. Everybody has a different opinion on a timeline. So we worked as a leadership group and we worked with members of our board of education. Uh, we took the survey into account. Um, we know there's people from the entire bell curve of concerns. And I get, I get that question or a similar question every single day for the last, you know, three months. And, and why, why, why are you doing it this way? Why aren't you doing it that way? And the only thing I can tell you is we're making the best decision we can possibly make given the information that we have. We want our kids back in school. And at some point we have to do that. And we've made that decision to be October 19th and November 2nd. So um, again, I mean, I'm not looking at right or wrong because at any given time, something can change the conditions that are around all of us that uh, make us have to adapt and, and, and fluctuate. But I hope that does not have to happen. Um, again, another question about starting ASAP. I understand that. Um, 
So this question is about the social distancing. Why are we pushing students back into class when we can't follow one of the main recommendations for COVID? Totally understand that. There is a wide debate about six feet versus three feet, depending on, again, your opinion and, and what, um, what group you listen to uh, for advice. So we know the goal is always gonna be to try to get to six foot, but we know we can't get kids back virtually hardly any school our size that I'm aware of can, can, but we can certainly do three to six and in many places, four or five. I personally believe, and I, I think one of the things they found to be one of the most important thing along with distancing are masks, right? And so someone asked earlier about masks. We need to wear masks. If, we, if our kids and our staff are, are committed to wearing masks, I think we can do this. Okay, and if we're committed as a community that when our kids are sick and we don't, you know, spread it, we can do this. And we're certainly going to do our part as a school system to to minimize the risk as much as possible. But again, we're, we're people just like everybody else and we're, we're, we, we can only do our best. And uh, but at some point we had to put a stake in the ground and make a decision. And that's what we did. Um, okay, what medical studies or resources did the board reference in order to make the full-time uh, decision? The health department still recommends working remote or hybrid, so is the survey the only thing driving this decision? Uh, no, the survey isn't the only thing driving this decision. Uh, I, I would say as the superintendent that at some point, like I just said, we have to make a decision because I don't know if in the next year we'll have anything definitive that says we should or shouldn't go back to school nor do any of you know we'll have anything definitive that says we should go or not go back to school. But what we do know in our county, and I get updates weekly, I shared it with our staff today, that the spread within Lucas County is very, very low and going down. Okay, so we know that, that we're in a good spot right now. Based on the conditions right now, the decision we made aligns very well. May not align with individual uh, individuals' opinions, but it aligns with what's happening in our area right now. So uh, again, that's, that's the best answer I can give you, um, is at some point we had to make a decision. Um, okay, are elementary students going to be taking their Chromebooks to and from school? Great question. Um, I don't know if we've answered that completely. We've had, we've had multiple discussions on it, to be completely honest with you. And, and I think that's one of those things we just are going to try to figure out. Um, I don't know, is, is, is Mr. Straka still on? I don't know if I've heard from him or Mrs. Soltes, maybe. We, 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 haven't made it, yeah, we haven't made a decision on that yet. So we're still discussing the pros and cons of that during the hybrid time. So we'll make sure everyone knows I you know we'll have a decision for that but we haven't made one definitively yet yeah good question and, and I know that can be difficult um, for some little kids to be carrying their device back and forth you know in the past prior to COVID the, the devices were just in the school on carts and so the kids had access to them they used them on a daily basis uh, we may go back to that but on the off chance that a, a classroom gets quarantined and, and the student doesn't have it for a period of time that becomes a logistical problem so we're going to have to make some decisions about that. I think that's one of those game time decisions we're going to have to make uh, with kids. Okay, uh, will winter sports continue for OCS? As of right now, I've not heard anything that will prevent winter sports from continuing. Yeah. So uh, as of right now, I, I believe that uh, we intend to, um, to uh, have sports. You know, I know the coaches are, are gearing up just like, we are, you know, obviously we're still in the midst of, of uh, fall sports, but uh, again, anything could change. And obviously winter sports are indoors, but volleyball has continued. And uh, I assume basketball will as well. So I'm just reading the next question. Exemptions can be made if they don't have a virus. Is that what I heard? because the virus can't, can't be transmitted before developing symptoms, you're setting a bad precedent. I, if you're talking about a mask exemption, 
there is the, 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 the state order has exemptions for individuals to not wear masks. So that is not my call. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a decision that I have a right to overturn. <laughs> so it is what it is. Uh, will teachers have the discretion to allow students to remove masks while in the classroom if that specific situation allows it to be a safe option, very small class size, plenty of space distance. As of right now, we are not going to be removing masks in classrooms. So um, we're going to keep class, you know, it's the mandate, it's the state order that we're going to keep masks on. So um, I do know some other schools are, are working hard to figure out ways to do that safely because mask breaks, if you will, or times that kids don't wear masks, you know, uh, it, you know, is probably going to be needed. But, but right now my stance is, is we're going to have to wear masks. I know at times, I mean, they will not be wearing masks at lunch while they eat. Um, they won't be wearing masks, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, group, but when they're doing any physical activity in phys ed, but maybe we are going to have them. It depends maybe what the activity is. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Holcomb, I see you kind of shaking. What, what's, your, what's your thoughts on phys ed? I think that, they're, that the majority of the time they will have masks on in phys ed, probably all the time. Okay. In, in our building. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the mask order is that they wear them at all times. So except when they're eating and doing, and doing those kind of things. So, um, you know, maybe there'll be some changes in that mask uh, ordinance as we move into the year. A uh, question about contact tracing. Uh, how far out will contact tracing go when a case is discovered? Their class, their lunch group, everyone in the same recess, everyone on the same bus. Good, good question. Contact tracing is going to be a key piece to keeping us in school. Um, what we know right now is that this is why it's very important for us as a school system to, um, to know where our kids are at all times. So that means classrooms, kids have to be, have seating charts. Lunch times, we have to do our best to have some kind of seating charts. Uh, it'll be a little bit harder at recess times, but we're gonna do our best to keep kids in pods or in, in groups and certainly from our classrooms. So the idea is, is that if a kid uh, comes down with COVID and there is a group of kids that are within six feet or have been exposed uh, for a period of time, then, then only that group of kids will be asked to quarantine at home. But that decision is going to be made pretty quickly, working directly with our lead school nurse, Sherry Sexton, our school nurses, our, our administrators, uh, and directly with the health department. Uh, and we're going to go back and we're going to contact Trace and talk through what is the appropriate um, level to go out? Um, because um, th it does not have to be everyone. It has to be only those that were legitimately or possibly e exposed. So will it shut down an entire class? Uh, there has been some orders that have indicated that we need to keep a class out for 24 hours, but we also know that there has been some quite a few, I do anyways, exceptions to that rule in other districts. So uh, we're going to be uh, doing everything we can to only quarantine the kids that have to. Uh, okay, let's see here. Just a couple of more minutes, folks. So I'm gonna try to find a topic that maybe hasn't been asked as I kind of go through these questions. A uh, uh, question about the 24-hour hand sanitizer. Uh, if we have 24-hour hand sanitizer, is there truly a need for consistent and excess use of hand sanitizer? And, and we believe no. Uh, but there are some routines in schools that, that have become routines for kids that are going to be putting, putting hand sanitizer on them. But uh, as Mr. Sandwich has said, and we continue to share with our, and we continue to double and triple and quadruple check with the 24-hour hand sanitizer that, um, Again, everything we know about it is it protects us for 24 hours. So there won't be a need for that. But we, we do expect every kid to at least do that once. Uh, but there will be times during the day, and you've heard it tonight, that, that some of the buildings probably will be doing that because uh, they're just, you know, it's, it's habit. It's what we've done for years already. So uh, if there's a medical issue or something to have too much of that on hands, we can certainly work with individual folks. 
Um, so here's one, uh, more of a comment. I believe firsthand, if the kids wear their masks, they sanitize and wash their hands and stay their distance as best they can, this will work. And boy, did you sum it up the best. Uh, I heard that on the radio today that really it's if we wear our masks and we're smart about what we're doing, this can work. So um, we're, we're, we're gonna try and uh, we're gonna do our best. And I need everyone to understand that. And, and there are, you know, I, I also, one of the things I did hear loud and clear from the community is they, they, they also, everyone, not everyone, we wanted to have a choice for others to come back to school. And, and all of the schools in Lucas County are now coming back hybrid. Uh, we'll see when and if how many of them come back to all, all students, but there are many other local districts that are out there that have kids back and there is going well for those schools. And I, I, I believe it will go well for Oregon City Schools as well, uh, given the, the situation that, we're out, that we have out in our area. Uh, quick question about the buses. How will kids be kept at least three feet apart? Uh, what we know about buses is we can have two to a seat. So they may not be three feet apart, but we'll, we'll spread them out as much as we can on the bus, two to a seat with masks uh, and hand sanitizer um, on the buses. Yep, good question. Uh, again, another question on busing. Um, just a, uh, it's not really a question, but a comment. We will be taking temperatures of kids coming in to the school uh, each and every day. They won't be taking temperatures um, before they enter the bus, but they will once they get off the bus entering the school. Okay, so, all right, I'm gonna go with two more questions here, see if there's something uh, different. Um, most of them have been asked, you know, pretty much, uh, I answered the temperature taking, um, busing. So the last question here on the, on the sheet is, will actual, and I'm not sure what it's asking, but will actual in-person enrollment be shared with parents prior to the start of the full day return? So I'm not sure what that is asking. Um, we are very fortunate, just to talk about enrollment a little bit, that, uh, oh gosh, help me out, Mr. Quigg, what, we've had about how many students, I know you just said it to me, total, that have uh, unenrolled our district since the start, since June, 160? 159. We are very fortunate that we have only had 159, and, and to give that a perspective, we have 3,500 kids in our, our schools. And that number's been pretty consistent. It's dropped a bit over the years, uh, but it's pretty consistent that we've only had 160 leave. And they've sprinkled and gone around to different places. And, and you know, like 15 or 16 of them have homeschooled. A few have opened and enrolled in local districts. A few have gone to online schools. But other school districts, I'm hearing of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids going to to other places. So I, I feel that is an absolute testimony to what, what we're doing here in Oregon City Schools that even though it's been bumpy and not been easy for our community, they've stuck with us and stuck by our side. And I wanna thank you all for that. Um, again, this is your community, this is our community, this is a community you gotta care about. And all of this was, was COVID. COVID is to blame for all this, not an individual, not a person, not an entity, but COVID. And uh, we all are reacting to it. So, so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, we will have a, another Q&A next Wednesday at 6 o'clock. That'll be our last one for at least this initial uh, part of the school year. And then we'll uh, kind of determine um, what next steps are. But I, I, listen, I appreciate very much the, the questions. And, and I know there was some venting going on in the Q&A. And, and, and that's OK. Um, that's okay because we need a place to vent and, and to put our, our thoughts out there. But I appreciate people doing it with respect uh, and professionalism because that's what I expect from our folks. And I really appreciate it from the community. So everybody, you have a wonderful, beautiful Wednesday night and uh, we will see you next Wednesday. Thank you, everyone.